The evidence for the existence of God is overwhelming. The heavens declare his glory. So why would someone be an atheist? Today on Truth and Love, we are digging into the mind of an atheist. What does the Bible say about speaking the truth in love? It is an exciting day. Of course, I'm always excited to speak the truth in love, but I love the topic we're talking about, and I love the person we're joined with. Dennis, thank you so much for helping us out again yeah. and looking into how does an atheist think. And I, I, why? Did, let's start with the Bible. Right. What does the Bible say about the thinking of someone who rejects the existence of God? And right. thanks for being here. Oh, man, it's exciting to be here. Um, the Bible says two things that are pretty definitive. First of all, the Bible says a fool in it, uh, says in his heart, there is no God. Now, not that the Bible is engaging in name calling, uh, but what the Bible says is that the evidence for God is so well known and seen throughout every aspect of creation that uh, to reject this understanding and this notion of God is really foolish. In, in other words, it goes against the, uh, the created order. Secondly, the Bible talks a lot about the fact that, listen, um, the things of God are absolute, absolutely foolish, foolishness to the unbeliever. And so therefore they reject it as being foolish, i.e. how can a good and loving God create a world that's filled with such unloving or cruel or disastrous consequences that we see. And it's really a misunderstanding regarding the nature and person of God. I, I would agree with that. I would also add, I think some things like, like um, we'll, we'll get into a little deeper, but the problem of evil, why do right. bad things happen to good people? I can't comprehend that, which I think is a specific example of the bigger thing that you're saying. Absolutely. I also would say um, hypocrisy. Sometimes mm -hmm. people claim to be Christian. They're certainly not, or they really are, but they've really failed their savior mm -hmm. in living out what the Bible says. And right. so an atheist looks at that and goes, how is your worldview redemptive? I want to look for something else. Right. And so I think there's a lot of reasons, but ultimately atheists give a different answer than maybe what Christians would give or what the Bible would say, um, because to them it sounds logical or rational. And I found this clip on YouTube that I think kind of, if you ask the atheist, community as a whole, why are you an atheist? I think this, this clip would kind of summarize it. So let's take a look. Yeah. Fortunately, I'm an atheist. I don't believe in hell and I don't fear hell and I don't fear your God. In fact, the fear of hell was the last straw for me. I stopped believing in God after studying science, after using critical thinking and rational thought to come to a conclusion that it's highly unlikely that such a character even exists. So it's a really interesting clip, a few words that I wanna uh, point out. He right. said that because of rational thinking, critical thought, he came to this conclusion, science. So this is what I believe most atheists are thinking in their mind is that they're perfectly justified to come to this conclusion because, well, science says so. Right. However, when you look at some of the early scientists of the modern era, Galileo, who mm -hmm. goes, I thank God, uh, who has made me the first observer of, of marvelous things. Newton, uh, who said the thumb alone would convince me of the existence of God. Or Sir yeah. Francis Bacon, who formulated the scientific um, model or, or the way we do science today, right. who said depth and philosophy bringeth man's mind about to theism. Mm. So, so we have these great scientists disagreeing with this claim that it's rational, scientific, and, um, and yeah, I don't know. Did you have any thoughts on the way a atheists think through that, Dennis? Yeah, absolutely. One of the things that I hear atheists say a lot is that I don't see any evidence for God. And I think one of the things that they miss is that perhaps they're only looking in one place. And let me explain quickly. Hmm. Let's say you lost your keys and you're looking for your keys and, and you see a beam of light and you go by that beam of light and you start looking for your keys and somebody passes by and they said, well, what are you doing? And he says, well, I'm looking for my keys. And they says, well, it, did you lose your keys right here? You're like, no, but this is where the light is. And they're like, okay, this might be where some light is, but you could have lost your key outside of the scope of that light. Maybe you need to find an external light to illuminate that key. So when I hear an atheist say something like, well, you know, um, 
I am looking at for evidence for God, but I'm only looking in one place. That tells me that they have a narrowed fo focus. The Christian would say, yes, there's evidence for God in his natural created order, and we see that, but there's also evidence for God in special revelation. So I would encourage the atheist, expand your sphere of um, evidence. I, I think that's good. I also find atheists not contending with the evidence that right. Christians bring because they say, well, I don't have any burden of proof, which, which to me is not necessarily problematic, right. but but oftentimes I'll hear atheists say, I have a non-belief. Right, right. Well, there's a difference between not believing anything and not believing that something is true. Correct. So if I go, well, I just don't believe anything about God. Well, that's one position. But if I go, I don't believe that that statement is true, then I need to contend with the evidence that is right. brought forward. And oftentimes I see atheists retracting from that, mostly because I believe they have this worldview of um, of naturalism or materialism. Right. And that's this idea that the only thing that exists is the material world. Right. Well, the Bible says God is a spirit. <laughs> exactly. So, so then we have to allow spiritual parameters for this transcendent being. Do you, do you see that as well? Yes, absolutely. One of the things that I've noticed with atheism is that their claim is too narrow to hold the weight of what they actually believe. So in other words, if you yep. believe that um, naturalism is, is all there is, or materialism is all there is, and yet you make such a sweeping claim that there is no God, you are actually claiming more knowledge than what you have. Right. And that's very dangerous. And you and I have seen that played out over and over and over again. Yeah, to even say the wallet's not here. Right. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, could it be over here? No, because this is the only place I'm looking. Therefore, the wallet doesn't exist. Exactly. We've got a clip that demonstrates the presupposition of this right from the outset of the clip when it talks about origins. And so let's take a look. The origin of the universe is the origin of everything. Multiple scientific theories, plus creation myths from around the world, have tried to explain its mysterious genesis. However, the most widely accepted explanation is the Big Bang Theory. The Big Bang Theory states that the universe began as a hot and infinitely dense point. Only a few millimeters wide, it was similar to a supercharged black hole. About 13.7 billion years ago, this tiny singularity violently exploded. And it is from this explosion, this bang, that all matter, energy, space, and time were created. What I want you to catch about that clip was the very first words. The origin of the universe is the origin of everything. Now, everything that was said after that was confined to a presupposition, which right. was everything material is all that matters. But there's things like love, hope, joy, peace. I want you to see an atheist that kind of runs with this. He actually has... Um, millions of views on wow. his stuff. He's got tons of subscribers. He's in a garage. So I think people <laughs> are like, oh, you just found the wackiest atheist. No, this would probably be what most, a most atheists say. And he talks about the evidence for God and listen to how he does the same thing. He confines the evidence. Take a look. I think the main reason I'm an atheist is because there is no God. That's a big one for me. The lack of a God. I think is probably the biggest reason why I don't believe in God. And I say that there's a lack of God because I've never seen any evidence for God and neither has anyone else. I've never seen any evidence for atheism and neither has anyone else. Did you see how he started that? He was confining the parameters. Absolutely. In other words, any evidence I, I present, because there's a lot of evidence for the existence of God, right. isn't evidence. And it's interesting in Romans 1, the Bible says that we worship the creation more than the creator, and then we profess ourselves to be wise. We become the arbiter of truth. Right. And we're seeing this confining yeah. way of approaching truth that, that really is inaccurate. Yeah, absolutely. And by, way, by that same token, it's actually very dangerous. Yeah. Imagine if we come into, you know, you and I are crime sleuths, <laughs> and we, we go into a situation where we see a murder, and, a, and it's a woman, um, and we say, okay, well, because 
uh, we see a woman dead, the only possible explanation is that a man murdered her. Um, that would be absurd because we're not looking at all the evidence or all the possibilities uh, from the evidence, and that could really cause us to not get to the truth of what's actually happening here. Now, having said that, is all, are all presuppositions bad? Or we could go a step further mm -hmm. and go, there is someone who's been murdered, right. or we see someone who is dead with a knife sticking out of them, yeah. and we go, oh, hang on. Whatever conclusion we come to, we cannot conclude that this person was murdered. Right. Right. So, so we then, go to completely so that, yeah, opposite direction. So we go, so here's a knife sticking out of their chest. <laughs> that would be the most logical conclusion. Right. And we remove that. And I would say that's kind of true with the existence of God. Exactly. That when you look at the universe, and, and some people say, well, you have to presuppose the existence of God. Well, in some ways that's true because right. we wouldn't have a mind. We wouldn't have a tongue. We wouldn't right. have any thought without God. So that's true. But even if you don't presuppose the existence of God, right. when you go investigating into the universe, the natural conclusion is, it seems like someone designed this. It right. seemed like someone caused this. And what's often happening is like, no, no, let's throw that this, evidence out. This is let's, completely we, true. We, can't even, we yeah. can't even pursue that. Absolutely. Um, but then the question comes, well, when you ask an atheist, well, what's your evidence for your position? Right. Now, I know most atheists would go, well, we don't, we don't need evidence because we have a non-belief. Right. But this atheist kind of pulls the curtain back on the evidence for the atheist position. Let's, let's take a look. This is pretty powerful. Here is my proof and evidence that atheism is accurate and correct. Atheism is accurate and correct. <laughs> okay, uh, that's it. That's all there is. All right, so I just have to tell it to you. That's just too good. We've got to watch that again. Here is my proof and evidence that atheism is accurate and correct. Atheism is accurate and correct. <laughs> okay, uh, that's it. That's all there is. All right, so I just have to tell it to you. So what's incredible about that clip is the boldness of someone who claims to be rational, right. scientific, yep. and going, here's my evidence, and then not offering any evidence. Right. Right. Why would someone do that? It is because they presuppose that the material world is all that exists. Right. So the moment I say, there, like God is a spirit, those that worship him in spirit and truth. The right. moment I say there is a spiritual world, they say, well, give me evidence of that. Right. Okay, well, evidence of that has to look different because it can't be physical. God isn't a physical being. And they're like, oh, well, then you don't have any evidence. For exactly. God. It's very confining. Yes, yes, it is. And something else we need to think about, what kind of evidence would really satisfy an atheist, right? Uh, again, you pointed this out. If we're none. talking, none, because we're talking about something that's fundamentally not material. We're talking about something immaterial. So if we're talking about something immaterial, we need a different kind of evidence. It would be like me saying, oh, you want to study the stars, Ben? Look underneath a microscope. That makes no sense, right? Yeah. What do you need? Well, you need a telescope. And so you could, you could see um, stars through a telescope, not a microscope. We're going to take a break, yeah. but when we come back, we're going to discuss this exact issue and its ramifications, which are scary. All right. Be back in a second. Want more information about speaking the truth in love? Text the word PREPARED to 345345. We will send you a free resource that will equip you to speak the truth in love. Also consider our Truth in Love digital resource for your church, small group, or family. Learn from six lessons that include videos from panel experts and teaching from Ben Shetler, all shot on location in New York City. Download it today at thecenterfortruthandlove.org. Welcome back to Truth and Love. We're discussing how is it that an atheist thinks or how is it that an atheist comes to the conclusions that they do? And the next clip is actually of Ricky Gervais having a conversation with Stephen Colbert, which is yeah. really two interesting, popular figures. And Stephen Colbert is arguing for the existence of God Absolutely. from from the the idea that we'll talk about in the next episode, the cosmological argument. And what's really interesting is Ricky Gervais won't allow that question to come up. He's like, no, no, let's change the question. Yep. Once again, an example of confining the yeah. evidence. Let's take a look. I know that you're uh, an atheist. 
correct? Yeah. Okay. People have been debating. Uh, that's the devil. That's the devil waiting for you in hell. By the way. Yeah. Would you want to debate the existence of sure. God? Okay. Yeah. So, uh, Ricky Gervais, is, is why is there something instead of nothing? Uh, that's, that's, that makes no sense you at all. You have to answer that's, my question. That's not the two choices. No, it's but the choices I'm giving you, I'm the host. Well, I don't... <laughs> you, uh, you want to concede the debate? Why is there something this, instead this, of nothing? Hold on. Yes. Uh, what do you mean, out of nothing? What do you, do you... Why is there something instead of why is there nothing? Why, why does the universe exist at all? Why but, is there something? But surely the big question is not why, but how? Well, why is it irrelevant? Okay, it? fine. How, how is there something? Because you think of God as the prime mover. How is there anything? Well, 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 I don't. I don't. This is this is a, a ridiculous. Is there a prime mover? If, if is, you, there a, is there a demiurge that started everything? Well, outside science and nature, I don't believe so. Because the, the interesting thing is, th this is the thing, right? So, I, I'm an agnostic atheist, technically. Ag agnost ag agnostics um, mean it means. No one knows whether there's a god, so everyone's technically agno agnostic. We don't mm -hmm. know. That's true. So that's true. an agnostic atheist is someone who doesn't know there's a god or not, as no one does. So you're not convicted of your atheism. Well, I am. Sure. No, I am because atheism is only rejecting the claim that there is a god. Atheism it isn't a belief system. Mm -hmm. Do you do you, uh, do you ever have a feeling of great gratitude for existence? I know, of course. Do you I, ever have? I know. I know. I know the chances are yeah. billions to one that I am on this planet as me and never will be again. And I know I uh, can't convince you that there there is a God, nor do I really want to convince you there's a God. But no. I can only explain my experience, which is that I have a strong desire to direct that gratitude toward something or of someone. Of course, no, of yeah. course. And that I mean, thing is that thing is God. We're mortal. We don't. We want. We want to make sense of nature and science, and, we, and it's too unfathomable that that. that that the, everything in the universe was once crunched into something smaller than an atom. But you don't Three... know that. Well... <sighs> You're just believing but, Stephen but not, Hawking, but, and that's a matter of faith in his abilities. Yeah, that, yes. You don't know it yourself. You're accepting that because someone told you. Yeah, well, but science, science is constantly proved all the time. You see... Uh, such an interesting exchange. I know both of us have watched that. Yeah. It's, it's really good. It's really yep. powerful. Yep. But what I want to point out is how immediately what, what uh, Stephen Colbert did was he used what we would call the cosmological argument, something we're going to start yes. in the next episode. So right. please tune back for that. But the moment he started using that, Ricky Gervais said, no, 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 wait, stop, pause, right. hold, hold the... That's not... The question we should be asking, of course, he wasn't that overt, but he's like, right. we shouldn't be asking that question. The better question is this. In other words, I'm not going to contend with the question, right. why is there something rather than nothing? Yeah. And that is the limitation of materialism, right. saying like, well, we can't even ask certain questions. What is meaning? What is purpose? Oh, you're not allowed to ask that in our worldview. Well, I want to know answers to that. <laughs> and that's why I yeah. love the Bible is it gives us answers for life. Yeah, absolutely. And let's take a look at the question, why is there something rather than nothing? That's not an illogical question to ask, no. right? If somebody asks me, like, where can I find a married bachelor? Yeah, that's, that's an illogical question, so I could dismiss the question on grounds that that's an illogical statement. But there's nothing illogical about the question in, way, in, in the way it was stated. So therefore, if there's nothing wrong with the question, Maybe there's something wrong with your worldview that doesn't give you the ability to answer the question. I think that's what we're dealing with. His worldview doesn't allow him to answer the question, and therefore he says, oh no, we can't ask, answer that question, we can't ask that question, and then he goes a step further and he puts agnosticism and atheism together. He says, well, you know, I'm an agnostic atheist. Well, that means nothing because that's illogical, right? You are claiming atheism a true, in your opinion, true justified belief. Agnosticism says there's no way I can truly know truth and therefore none of my beliefs are truly justified and therefore I can't really hold it as a belief. So even he was being contradictory in the way in which he answered a very logical question. One of the illustrations I always like to give when in analogies of what's occurring here, this limitation of not allowing the evidence to go to God, right. is a young, young man, he grows up on a cruise ship his whole life. And one day at breakfast, he tells his mom and dad, I don't believe boats exist. <laughs> they take him to the captain, they take him to the engineer and they say, who's wrong? Running this. They take him to the, the edge of the boat and say, we're not in the water. What's keeping us out? And his answer is always, 
Well, I don't know yet. Maybe if I keep investigating, I'll figure out what this is, but I know this, it's not a boat. And I feel like that's what's often, and I speak with atheists all the time through Twitter in real live conversations. And I always find the moment you bring evidence, they go, no, no, that can't be evidence for God. That may be evidence of something, but not God. And I think as we get in these next few episodes, when we deal with the the evidence, we've got to remember the evidence is uh, is being limited by a, a presupposed worldview. Right. Got an exciting interview with Josh McDowell, mm-hmm. um, uh, an apologist. Uh, over fifty million of wow. his uh, copies of his books yeah. sold worldwide, and uh, I got to sit down with him at the Red Rock Amphitheater out in Denver, Colorado, a really cool venue, and uh, we just kind of discussed some apologetic speaking truth and love, and I felt like that would be really relevant as we ended our episode today. Um, so let's take a look at Josh McDowell, my interview with him, discussing um, just some important aspects of apologetics. So we were, uh, I actually got to speak with you at a conference up in Illinois. And afterwards, we were like, several of the speakers were all eating together. And you said this, you said the big shift in both the millennial and Gen Z generation was not, they're not looking for, does God exist? They're looking for, why is God good? And I knew exactly what you meant by that when you said said that, but could you expand on that? Because it was so It's more with Gen Z. It's more of those about 25, now, I 30. I think it's younger millennials as well. Well, I, that's I, what I'm I, saying, up to 25 to 35 okay, years so old. Okay, younger millennials yeah. on the Gen Z, yeah. Uh, and, and the way I put it, before they want to know if Christianity is credible, they want to know is Christianity good. And one reason for that is the Internet. But you see, up until about 12 years ago or so, young people everything around the world were not exposed to the negative things of Christianity because you didn't have the multimedia everything that we have today and so when they would hear from the church they would always be preaching the good or the the um, uh, the good salvation everything and then when the internet came along here's young people 10 11 12, 13, 14, 15 years old experiencing negative things of Christianity, comments about Christianity, uh, the pastor that you know was damning um, uh, racial equality, uh, homosexuals and everything, uh, all of a sudden that, they're exposed to that. They never were before. Mm. And they're actually almost first exposed to that before the positive things of Christianity. And so with the average, and I understand that they want to know, well, if it's not good, I don't want to know if it's true. And that's to me is logical. And that's why we need to be able to be prepared to have apologetics of goodness. I'm not ready for you. I'm still working on it. And I want to, I want to get it down so I can help others. Barna and Lifeway, two great, uh, research organizations and they did some studies why are kids leaving the church why are they leaving their faith and it came out two reasons one intellectual questions no one will answer my questions second is not relevant to me so then say uh, lifeway came along did a study well what will bring them back this is incredible to take away was intellectual and as it relates to my life. To bring them back, one, if the pastor presents truth in a way that I understand it, and two, it's relevant to my life. I've never seen two research like that. That really backs up, this is what we're facing. The intellectual skepticism and relational value uh, to it. And this is why the biggest question, the the profoundness of people is not so much the answers they give, it's knowing to ask the right questions. And that's intellectual to me. And the number one question today, and I got this way back from uh, Justin Martyr about 1,000, well, no, 130 AD. Justin Martyr. The biggest question is, so what? So what? So God is God, so it's true, so what? What does it mean to me? 
Now, I'm doing this off the top of my head. It seems like almost 80% of all millennial Christians said they have no, this is the most tragic stat in the history of the church. They had no idea of how their faith related to their job or profession. So what? I did enjoy talking with Josh, just mostly because of that venue is so beautiful <laughs> at Red Rock. Yeah. If you're ever out in Denver, definitely check out the Red Rock Amphitheater. As you can see, you can go and exercise there if they don't have any <laughs> concerts going on. There's actually a Chris Tomlin concert wow. um, occurring in that venue just a little while after. It's a beautiful, beautiful place just outside of Denver, Colorado. But if you're watching right now, Dennis, right. there may be people going like, well, you talked about how atheists think and how they can find the evidence, but you didn't give any evidence for the position of theism or for the Christian right. God. Right. And uh, we're definitely going to do that in the next yeah, two episodes, absolutely. so tune back in. But what are some of those evidences just generally Oh, goodness, speaking? I don't know where to start. I mean, yeah. there's the cosmological argument, there's the moral argument, there's the fine-tuning argument, there's the ontological argument. We can go on and on. There's tons of but evidence. What, when you say God. cosmological, what, what is that? This basically right. a... Absolutely. Well, the cosmological argument simply says says, listen, if we, in our, in our experience, see something created or made, then we can look back and say there is a creator. The moral argument said, listen, if we could observe objective moral values, then there's an objective moral value giver. Uh, the fine-tuning argument says that our world is fine-tuned so precisely that if there, if this fine tuning exists, then there's some kind of mind that exists to fine tune that exactly. And of course, the ontological argument is simply that if we could conceive of a high moral being, that which is most perfect, what the ancient philosophers call um, the maximum ideal, then that ideal, if it's possible, exists um, because of the fact that it can possibly exist. Yeah, the ontological argument is one that I really struggle with. <laughs> um, next week, Dennis will explain all of it. But as we conclude in, in our show today, what breaks my heart is the fact that there are people walking through this world without purpose, without meaning, without hope. And the Bible gives us that. And so if you're wondering, why, Ben, are you a Christian? Why, Dennis, are you a Christian? It's because the Bible gives help and hope. And so I hope you'll turn to the Bible for that. And if you're a believer, uh, you have to be, all of us have to be speaking that hope to those that don't believe. And that's why our show exists. Thanks so much for watching Truth In Love. For more truth about current topics, follow Ben Shetler on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. Visit the centerfortruthandlove.org where you can download resources to equip your family, learn through our curious conversation videos, or even book Ben Shetler to speak at your church or upcoming event. Our ministry is supported by the generous giving of people like you. Please consider giving a monthly or one-time tax-deductible gift at the centerfortruthandlove.org forward slash give.